Good afternoon, Saints. Welcome to Grace Baptist, the meeting of Grace Baptist Church for the 9th of October. I've got um, something that I've been seeing almost every day of the week if I'm paying attention. And I, I just sort of wanted to share it with you. I don't particularly like the word share, but uh, when you're coming down Highway 77 and you get to, uh, you pass a family dollar store and a dollar store, and you get to the top of that hill, you can see miles forward. And right almost in the middle is a water tower. It's coming this way. <laughs> coming, coming south on 77. And you see this water tower. And you can see it for about four seconds. And then it drops below the horizon again. And you don't see it until you get to... The... What's the name of it? Moss Hill. Moss Hill Road. And uh, you, see, you see the water tower. And that just reminds me of these Old Testament prophets. They saw the coming of the Lord. Remember the one about the puzzle I told you? It's similar to that. But you don't see everything until He comes. And we are so blessed to live in the side of He has come. Because we can see it all. And we know He's coming to see us. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Galatians, the third chapter. And we'll start with verse 25. And we will probably finish the chapter today if I don't get too wordy. Don't throw anything at me. We'll, we'll reserve it the next week if we have to. Verse 25. But since that faith has come, we are no longer under a pedagogue or a discipliner. Most translations say tutor or guardian. The pedagogue was a discipliner. He didn't teach. He said, He gave us boundaries. For through faith you are all sons of God in Christ Jesus. Through what? Through your love? Through I might? Or because you believe in Jesus. Because you believe in Jesus. For those of you who were baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. You're wearing His garments. There is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, since you are all one in Christ. And if you belong to Christ, <coughs> then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. May the Lord add His blessing to the reading of His Word. Our Abba Father, we thank You for Your Word. We ask that we would have the faith to believe what You have told us and that we would stand on these promises and not on ourselves. We ask that Your Word would open minds and hearts today, that they would be blessed, the lost would hear the Gospel and be saved. We pray these things in the one whose soft sound of His sandals feet that we hear this afternoon. May we see Jesus and Him only. And we pray these things in His name and in the power of the Spirit. Paul, in verse 15, we're not going to go back and read it, begins an argument that the law does not invalidate the promise. But by the time Christ came... What were the Pharisees doing? They were invalidating the promise. They did not recognize the promise who stood in front of them. The promise was given to Abraham and his seed, not seeds as a many. The law came 430 years after that. And so, because it came after, it is subordinate. The law is subordinate to the promise. And the promise cannot be revoked. 
The law is inferior to the promise. Who do we look to to be saved? Christ? Yes. We don't look to the law, do we? Because the law cannot save. Only Christ can save. The law was given to provoke transgressions. It was temporary and given through a mediator. Christ came to take away our transgressions, not to provoke them. He came as a permanent Savior. And because He is God Himself, He does not need a mediator because He is fully God and fully man and He can enact for both God and man. The main truth then is, as we look at this Galatians is believers are the seed of Abraham by virtue of being united to Christ. Who's the seed of Abraham? Christ. If we are united to Him, we are the seed of Abraham. We are not individually the seed of Abraham based on what we do. We're all children of God through faith and one in Christ. In the Old Covenant, you had a mediator. Why? Because you had a conflict. What was the conflict? You sin a man against the sinless and holiness of God. When Christ came, He fulfilled the promise to crush the servant, the serpent. And He did this because that was His job to do. And He wiped out the conflict. What did Paul say in Romans? We have been reconciled with Christ. If you're in Christ, there is no conflict. The conflict is outside of Christ. In the Old Testament and in the New, the word sin means to miss the mark. Up until Moses, people were sinners, right? They all died, right? They were sinners. Why were they sinners? They missed the mark. When the law came, they became transgressors like Adam. Adam was a transgressor. God said, do not eat. Adam ate and we all died. Christ died and we will all feast in Him. <laughs> Justification is a gift that... Christ brought to us. It's His work. Justification is our believing in the work of Christ. It's not about our feelings. When Satan comes and nags you, what does he do? He points to your feelings. He refers you back to something you did. And he said, how can you approach a holy God? Look what you did. And He'll even give you the date and time if you want to hang around and listen for it. It's to shame us and to disable us. But if Christ has paid for your sins, what do you owe? Nothing. You're clothed in His righteousness. The Holy Spirit may point you to something that you did, but He points you to Christ when He does it and says, Look! Your sin is nailed to that cross where Christ paid for it and you do not owe anymore. The writer of Hebrews said, keep looking to Jesus. The law intended to function as a type of a babysitter. Now that Christ has come, we don't need a babysitter. You know that guy that's running for uh, governor, I think, it, no, senator in... Um, Wisconsin has lived off his parents for years. As a, he's had a babysitter all his life and now he wants to be a, a senator. We don't need a senator. We are fully in Christ today. Romans 10.4 says Christ is the end of righteousness by the law. What does that mean? So you cannot be righteous by the law because He has already fulfilled it for you and you're counted as righteous. In the Old Covenant, we had, if you obey, you will be this and this and this. Did they obey? No. 
They were all covenant breakers, except for two that did enter the promised land, Joshua and Caleb. The rest of them did not keep covenant, and they all died in the wilderness. But God's promise, and this is one, one verse I think we all need to know, and we only need to believe it. See, most people have heard this verse, but they don't believe it. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through Him the Amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Christ has wiped out your sin debt. What is your response? Amen. Can I get a witness in the house to that? Amen. Amen. Okay. <laughs> Are you guilty? No. Have you broken covenant? No, why? Because the covenant is between God and Christ. Did Christ break covenant? No. So why do we feel like we've broken covenant? It used to bother me when I was in the Presbyterian church to hear somebody say, I've broken covenant. No, you haven't. Because the covenant is not with you. It's with Christ. That's what happens when you don't get out of the old covenant in your theology. In the Old Testament, Israel was called God's son. Listen to this. This, this is enlightening. Then say to Pharaoh, this is in Exodus 4th chapter, this is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son. Then in, and I know Brock remembers this one, Jeremiah 31, 9. Because I am Israel's father, and Ephraim is my firstborn son. Ephraim was another term used of Israel, of northern ten tribes. And we see in... Um, Hosea 11, 1, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. You say, what does that have to do with us? Well, Matthew took that verse in Hosea. And he gave it to Christ. We spoke about this a couple of weeks ago. In um, Matthew 2, 15. When he stayed, where he stayed until the death of Herod, and so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. So if you're in Christ, you are what? The Son of God. Because you're in Christ. Not because of anything you've done. That doesn't deify you, but it means you're in Christ and God treats you as Christ as the firstborn. And then um, he says in verse 27, we are immersed in Christ. And he uses the word term baptized. That was a bad word, but that's the way King Jimmy wanted it because he didn't want immersion. They sprinkled in the Anglican church. And so when... Usually when something's translated, it's translated. But he's, ta he's not talking about a right here. He's talking about us being in Christ. And we are fully immersed in Christ. If we weren't, God could not accept us. Because He would see us. And we see this in Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Don't you know that all of us who were immersed into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? When Christ died, we died. It goes on to say, We were therefore buried with Him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. We died with Him. We were buried with Him. We raised with Him. Amen. And we have ascended with Him for we have been united with Him in a death like His, we will certainly also be united with Him in a resurrection like His. For we know that our old self was crucified with Him 
so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. We are free, brothers and sisters, free from sin, from the penalty of sin, from the power of sin, and one day the presence of sin. Isaiah takes this theme. I know that's Old Covenant, Old Testament, but listen to this. This is it's in the 61st chapter of Isaiah. It says, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. And what are those garments? It's the very righteousness of Christ. His human righteousness that He lived for us. And arrayed me in a robe of His righteousness, salvation, righteousness, as a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, and a bride adorns herself with her jewels. We are the bride of Christ. We are adorned with Christ. What could be more accepting of God than His very own Son? That is who we are with. We're united with Christ. Now, sonship does not depend on outward signs. You're not a son because you were baptized or circumcised. It's whether you're in Christ or not. Whether you have the faith of Abraham. Not whether you've done something. Because we see in Galatians 3.16, by the seed of Abraham. Not seeds, but the seed of Abraham, we are sons of God. He does not say baptism has replaced circumcision as an initiation rite to stress his faith in Christ. He says, this applies to Jews and Gentiles. There's no ethnic difference. It applies to the free and the slave. It applies to male and female. We're all one in Christ. The law depended on these distinctions. When you go through the Old Testament, it depended on distinctions. The Gospel does not because Christ is who? Very God of very God. And He's very man of very man. And the image of God is what? Male and female. God is just as much in... A female is just as much in the image of God as a male is. Bye -bye. The free man and the slave. The Jew and the Gentile. All in Christ are the same. The law depended on this distinction, but not the gospel. Who are Abraham's true sons in? Those in Christ. The inheritance does not come by birth, but by rebirth. The primary purpose of Paul's letter was to address what it means to be free or not under the law. We are not under the law. Even you remember those Judaizers we talked to? They wanted to put everybody under the law? Were they under the law? No, but they put themselves under the law, didn't they? We are not under the law because the law is gone. And when by law, I mean the old covenant law. I don't mean that we don't obey, love one another, and love God. Okay? I don't mean that. I mean we're not under the old covenant law. So, when Jews believed, did they become free from the law? Yes. They were just as free from the law as the Gentiles. The Jews that didn't believe became what overnight? The Gentiles. Unbelieving Jews are just as much a Gentile as a Greek is or anybody else that's not in Christ. So, we saw last, well, week before last that the pedagogue was our discipliner and he kept us from falling. But we have something new in the New Testament, New Covenant. Look at John 16. I tell you, it is good for you that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I do go, I will send him to you. And you notice he says, I will send him. He didn't say, I will send it. Right? Send Him to you. When He comes, He will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin because people do not believe in Me. What is their sin? They don't believe in God. They don't believe in Christ. 
because I, about righteousness because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And about judgment because the prince of this world now stands judged. I want you to notice something about that passage. Jesus does not say that the Comforter will convict the world of sin because they broke the law. He says, because they don't believe in Me. See, in the Old Covenant, the issue was whether you're loving God by obeying or hating God by disobeying the law. In the New Covenant, it's about the person and the work of Christ and it's refusing to bow to the Lord's anointed King. The second Psalm pointed to this and said, Kiss the Son, lest you be found to be unrighteous. The ministry of the pedagogue has ceased. The Holy Spirit is now the believer's teacher. You say, how can that be? He speaks through the Word. He does not speak through the law. The believer's teacher, of course, uh, the law is there and can function as a helper of our faith, but he has no authority to accuse you. It only has authority to accuse those that are not in Christ. Nor does it excuse you. Okay? Some people think, oh, I'm not accused, and then they live like they want to. No, can't do that. He doesn't accuse, but he doesn't excuse you either. It's because when we sin, what we're doing is what? Not believing in Christ. He has no authority over our lives anymore. Because Christ has endured every curse the law put on us. And He became the curse so that we would not have to be cursed. Galatians is the only New Testament book that asks and answers the questions about the believer's relationship to the law. Now Hebrews does not ask the question, but it does put answers out there. You remember when we were in there. The purpose and the end of the law's ministry... The ministry of death. The law is the ministry of death. The old covenant law. Okay? I didn't say anything about new covenant law. I said the old covenant law is the ministry of death. The author of Hebrews was not comparing the condition of a weak and immature Christian with a mature Christian. He was comparing Judaism to Christ. It was pictures and types Faded photographs. One, one Sunday I want you to sing faded photographs for us, okay? <laughs> he is comparing the status of Old Covenant saints and New Covenant saints. Not two kinds of Christianity. It is shadow versus substance. Pattern versus reality. Visible, invisible. Facsimile to the real thing. Type, anti-type picture and the actual person. Galatians does the same thing in a slightly different angle. As we're going through Galatians 3 and 4, we will see some of this. But there's two time periods. The Old Covenant before Christ, we'll call that B.C. I wonder where I got that. And how about New Covenant in Christ, A.C., after Christ, not A.D. <laughs> two statuses. An immature child that needs a pedagogue or the mature, full sonship that can stand on his feet because he's in Christ. We're not contrasting unbelievers with believers, but the status of childhood and being grown up. Are you a grown up? Paul said, I could not talk to the Corinthians because they were carnal. What was he saying? They were acting like immature children. He didn't say they weren't saved. There probably were some in there that weren't saved. But of all the people that he talked to in his second letter, he says, y'all fixed your situation. The old covenant was every bit of God's family, just like we are. But they were not complete, as we saw in Hebrews, apart from us. But they were God's family, and now we're joined together. But we have adult privileges in Christ that they didn't have. What, what was adult privilege? First, Christ came. And second, all of us
have the Holy Spirit living in us. That they did not have. Occasionally somebody would get the Spirit upon him, but they didn't have the Spirit permanently indwelling them. Because of Christ's redeeming work, anyone who will confess Him as Lord and trust His resurrection will be saved without exception. The one who is the vilest person that you know can come to Christ. Have you noticed on social media about all the talk about Jeffrey Dahmer? Do you know who Steve Brown is? Do you know who Steve Brown is? Do you know who Steve is? Okay, I've, I've followed him over the years. Um, I first met him in Panama City. Uh, but he's written a lot of books. Uh, he's Key Life. Does that mean anything to anybody? Well, he wrote a book, uh, When Your Rope Breaks. He wrote when uh, uh, being good is not good enough. He's saying if you think you're a good person, that's not good enough. You need Christ. Well, when they found Dahmer's murdered body in his cell, he had that book in his cell. And so some people believe that he may in fact have become a saint while he was in prison. Does it offend us that somebody like him is going to spend an eternity with Christ and the good old grandmother down the street that doesn't think she needs Christ and is not going to be in Christ is going to suffer. Does that make sense to us? Do we like that? No, we don't like that. We want the grandmother to be saved and Dahmer to get what he so justly deserved. I'm here to tell you, if I get what I am justly deserved, I'm going to be with that grandmother. But, because I'm in Christ and He's paid for my sins and given me His righteousness, I will not have to pay for my sins just like Jeffrey Dahmer has escaped his payment. The vilest person that believes in Christ will be saved. All the ones that will believe, as Brock said earlier, we implore you to be reconciled to Christ. For he who knew no sin was charged with the sins of his people and he paid for them so that the people could have his righteousness. Come to Christ today. Today is the day of salvation. As long as you draw breath, you can come to Christ. And I urge you to do it today. In Jesus' name, amen.